Um, can anybody see this right now? Yep, we can see. Okay, it says digital marketing trend. Can I get a thumbs up? I could see everybody's face, by the way. If you could able to see the like the whole thing, just give me a thumbs up. Like this. Okay, yeah. Okay, that's that's great, Sarah. Thank you. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, cool. Um okay. Um so um, before I start with the lecture, I, I since you guys are, you know, so how many, so let me just ask a question. How many of you are writing a big paper uh, for your final assignment in some classes? A huge paper. Can I get a thumbs up if you're writing a paper? One, two, three. Oh, wow. Just three of you? Okay, well, anyways, um, I just want to like share like one, um, the AI program that I think is really useful, just like the word tune, but it's much more uh, interesting. Um, so, okay, so I'm just gonna uh, introduce this AI pr a writing program called HyperWrite. Of course, there's other, so many like AI programs out there, like Grammarly, uh, word tune, which I just introduced a few weeks ago, um, uh, Quillbot, so on, there's so many great um, apps out there that really does wonder for, oh, for your writing. Um, but the thing is, sometimes it's kind of tough to find the right idea, I'm sure, when you write a paper, right? Or the hook that you need to begin a piece of content. So for me, th that's how I feel sometimes because I, I have to write a lot of paper. Um, but I just want to introduce um, this hyperwrite. Um, which is, I don't use this, but I use this for like when I'm doing a promotion for conference talks and they need like really one liner or something like that. Um, you know, I, I mostly focus on my energy on my own writing rather than just promotional poster. So I can't, sometimes I rely on this, a, not a lot of times, but my friends working in the ad advertising work on this a lot. So HyperWrite is an AI writing app. Um, I want you guys to like, you know, while I'm actually talking about this, you may, if you're using a PC right now, I want you guys to like, um, just search for HyperWrite and just start working out, working for yourself. This is gonna be, do wonders for you in terms of coming up with some ideas for writing, a, not just writing a paper for your assignment, but also um, for coming up with some ideas for uh, doing a copywriting for advertising or some marketing stuff, you know, that's gonna be really helpful, right? So. Um, so it's an AI, right? So I usually, uh, if you go onto the website, uh, you have a PC, I, I really suggest you do that. So I started a new document earlier and so I said like basically do some like screenshots and paste it in prompt. So I just typed in right here. It said, um, being creative is difficult. That's where AI can help. That's what I just wrote here. And I just like right here, you see the blue button, right? And I just like click on like auto write button. Um, yeah, you guys all see that. I know it's really small, but um, so what happened is that I get a number of options in the below, right? So some of which are not too bad. Um, please give try it out as I'm explaining this on your own computer right now, if you can. So, you know, um, so it gives me options, like different options and ideas. And the, the second one I kind of likes because I always like have trouble. If you click, if you not, not click, but if you like put your mouse around this area, it'll just automatically put your writing into right here. And, you know, I like the second one because I have trouble with a blank page or blank screen and the AI wrote, you are starting at, you're staring at a blank page, right? And the cursor blinks back at you and you have no idea where to start. You've always been told that creativity is essential to success, blah, blah, blah. Well, like, I think you agree that's not too bad for a first try. So let me like give you like inside like HyperWrite and show you how it works. Um, so for starters, like once you set up your account, you can like choose between like the free version or a number of other paid options, but like regardless of which one you select, all the plans include access to an AI personalization feature, um, the HyperWrite editor, and an easy to use Chrome extension that gives you writing suggestion across the web and can be integrated with your Google Docs, right? Um, 
And, you know, let's go back to the main dash dashboard. And from here, you know, we want to like create a new piece of content, right? So all you do is click on the new document a button and I'm going to paste I wanted this, I pasted in prompt with what we had before. Like what I just wrote here is being creative is difficult dot. That's where AI can help, right? And so now what you'll notice is that you have different options in below, right? Um, it's not, are, are you guys like used, um, for those of you on the PC right now, are, are you guys like using it right now? Um, so tell me, tell me what you think about it on the chat room. I, I, uh, I'd love to know what you're, responses. So you will have different options below. So I'm going to choose the one I liked. And then again, I like the second options. It looks pretty good. So that's all you do. If you find the one you like, you just basically click the press button, right? And it's added to your text. And now you can type in here as well, right? Um, or, or you can just add more content below that if you want. So it's all up to you how you use it but you can see how easy it is and how the AI gives you ideas, right? So what if you want to change the tone? Um, well, you can just highlight like this, one sentence like this, right? And you can just make it like, and you can't, you, this new window pops up, right? You can make it casual or, a, or the AI can, right? So you can make it sound more formal. Um, or you can customize it, say you want it um, to be more serious and academic or something like that, right? Like something else you can do is, uh, if you're writing a specific type of content, you can click on like hyper tools over here um, and you'll notice you'll, you're taking to a whole bunch of different essay, uh, sorry, different, uh, different easy to use tools that you can use, whether it's a blog, outline generator, uh, could be a grammar fixer, maybe a keynote generator, product product descriptions, meta descriptions, blog post ideas, or Instagram, you know, writing ideas, you know, if you're using a lot of TikToks and you, you need, and, you know, their, their description are short, but if you want to write a longer ones, this, this is like really, comes in really handy. So I'm going to, like, for example, I did like a, I clicked on a title generator just to give you an idea of how easy it is. So what I'm going to do is just paste and copy that the AI wrote for us, right? Which is this one right here. Um, I know it's just like all screen capture, but, but anyways, I put the paragraph right here and the AI is going to read that in the way that AI can read and it's going to generate a title, right? So you give me some titles right here. So here are some three options we got so we can get more like, so title for this paragraph could be like, is creativity a learned skill? Creativity, a skill or inborn talent? Is creativity something you can learn? Not bad, right? So again, like not the greatest, but not too bad and something you can definitely work with. Um, yeah. But hold on, so, so I'm not done yet. So because you cannot expect an AI to do all your work for you, uh, that's really dangerous actually. Um, so that's once you know that the consider is output your first rough draft, okay? So HyperWrite or other AI writing apps like Wordtune that um, might fix the challenge of the blank screen, but it's up to you to review the ideas pick the best ones and check for errors and then edit and polish your copy to add them uh, much of a human touch, right? Um, so does anybody have any questions? I, I find this really useful sometimes, uh, not for my writing, my article, but, um, or essay, but something like smaller. Uh, have anyone used it, used it right now just while I explain to all of this? If so, can you just show me, share me what you think? I'm I'm really curious curious to know whether it's, do you think this is going to be helpful or not. Yeah. Well. Okay. Well. Well. I just. Well. Anyways, that was a. Uh, that's my recommendation. Anyway. All right. So let me just talk about the digital marketing trends of this year. Um. Yeah. Just let me tell tell you about this. So the thing is. Um. 
Um, right, so you might find this hard to believe, but there was a time when I thought I knew everything I needed to work in, uh, in PR. So of course, uh, um, you know, so I may have been like naive, but I had some years experience under my belt and many successes before I like turn, turn my career to academia and teaching at a university. So all that, that all changed with digital and social media, right? So I discovered there are so many things I didn't know or had to learn. So I felt overwhelmed, but I decided to do something productive about it. Um, you know, so I started reading blogs and tech publication, uh, following the platforms and thought leaders, finding out about the latest digital trends, writing about them and testing them out. It made me feel like I'm a student again. I kind of loved it. Um, yeah. Um, and also I kind of lo look at all these social media experts. I kind of talk to them, um, listen to their talk or, or conference, um, you know, who people who conduct like social media trainings or workshops for companies of all sizes. And, you know, um, I, I, I mean, for me, like I, I see myself as like a lifelong learner and digital trend hunter. And I, whenever I look at all these um, things happening out there, I mean, especially the one that I just introduced you, like the hyper right. I mean, there's so many, like when I, something they write better than me, I'm just like amazing. You know, there's, you, you, it, it kind of tells you that um, you'll never know what you're going to get in the near future. Like they're probably, there are going to be people like writing for you just because you write a few sentences and they're going to write the whole paragraph, which is, this is crazy. Um, but anyways, um, but right now today, I'm going to be covering what's new uh, this year, um, but more important, how the changes affect your, like your business or your career tra trajectory and what other companies are doing to adapt, right? Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna, you know, try to talk about stuff that kind of gives, um, that even gives me like more motivation to keep up with the latest and greatest and share what I find with you. So yeah, I just want you guys to remember that, um, you know, this thing's like trend changes a lot. And um, so I, I think it's very really important for me to give you some like, what was what's new out there in this within this marketing field um okay so thing is uh i'm gonna give you some tips on that how to navigate to um tips on like how to get the most out of this course or this today's and next week next lesson is going to continue into next week um, so it's, it's designed to help you stay on top of like digital marketing trends. And that's why we are sharing, like I'm sharing like new lessons um, for today and next week. So, but the course is that um, isn't today's and next week's lesson isn't just about what's new, right? This also reveals how marketers apply their strategic and create creative minds to the latest digital innovation and how they test, learn, and adapt, right? So I've divided this uh, this lesson into four main chapters or themes. So mobile, so first one is mobile and video, social apps and as the I in AI, and data privacy. And so when you're watching the movies, you can view them by chapter or chronologically and whatever works best for you. And yeah, I mean, you could just look back um, as I'm uploading this recordings on this blackboard. Um, and the first the first one or two um, lessons are foundational and set the stage for what we'll be looking at as a course develops, right? So I suggest you start with those, I guess, which I'm gonna be talking about right now. Um, and we're also gonna look looking to make this a collaborative experience by um by you know letting you know all these like and share these any digital marketing trends or news that catches your eye or maybe you have questions about one of the trends and yeah i mean if you have questions about this just let me know and yeah just 
if there's one thing for certain, I think is that changes to the digital landscape aren't going to stop or slow down anytime soon. But think of this as a journey of discovery. We're all in together, right? So let me just start with the first lesson, mobile and video, which is a foundational part. Okay, so let's talk about ups and downs of the vertical um, video. If, before I start, does anybody have any questions? Okay, so do you guys know this phrase, stand up straight, right? No? Okay, so uh, I, about this term stand up straight, I kind of heard, um, it's something that I heard all my life as a kid. Um, maybe you did too. Um, you could call that the first like vertically inspired performance, which may or may not the, be the precursor to vertical video. Mm, probably not. Like, okay, so vertical video that is video we consume in a like portrait mode, right? Not like this, but like this, right? Um, so portrait mode on our mobile device has certainly come of age, right? So the term like was coined by Snapchat, but has been popularized on Instagram and Facebook. And now it's gaining even more traction with IGTV. And IGTV is, a, is Instagram's take on longer form of vertical programming. The shows can be up to an hour in length and well-produced, which means brands need to create higher quality vertical video content. Instagram even created a handbook for social video creators. So they, they offer tips on how uh, they offer tips on apps and tools and how to capture and edit what accessories you'll need and how to upload from mobile and desktop. So they're hosting it on Dropbox and you can download it from there or directly to your desktop device, right? Um, so idea is reminiscent of what users see on Snapchat's Discover channels uh, where brands and publishers create original vertical formal shows, right? Um, right, so the vertical video is an anathema to film enthusiasts because of its small, narrow screen. I mean, you don't let you, um, you don't like, you know, get to see what's on the edges, right? And even the well-respected like BBC, which as a television broadcaster, um, produce most of its like broadcasting for the wider screen, develop a vertical formal a format for his app, knowing that nearly half of his digital news videos are watched there. Um, so like the early days of the, uh, like the early days of TV, the vertical videos is described as a close-up medium and that works well on a mobile device or Perhaps it's just capitalize on a natural smartphone behavior. You see, like 94 94% of us hold our, hold our phone vertically when we're recording videos. And three quarters of millennials watch video vertically on their mo mobile device, right? Um, aesthetics aside, if you want to engage your customers on mobile, you need to embrace vertical video. Our eyes may take in the widescreen when you, we're looking around us, but on smartphones, it's not a panoramic view. It's more of a like up and down, right? Okay, so before I move on, does anybody have any comments or questions about this? Uh, if you do, you can just comment. If you have comments about this, so you can just write your thoughts in the chat room if you like. Um, so anybody? All right. Um, let's kind of do this like the, it's more comfortable this way. Okay. Um, all right. So any any comments so far? 
Okay, so does this sound familiar? So you're in the like middle of one thing and all of a sudden you have an urge to grab your smartphone and find out something else, right? I do that, it's probably more than I should. And, you know, it's realized that I'm not alone because 91% of us exhibit that type of behavior. Google called these short bursts of interest micro moments and they divided them into like four main types. So I want to know moments are when we want to learn or discover something, right? I want to go like focus on locations. I want to do is when people are like looking for ideas, right? And of course, like when you're ready for to purchase, that's an I, I want to buy moment, right? So what are we looking at? I mean, it could be anything like say it's the middle of the winter, right? And we just feel the need to get away somewhere warm. And that's an I want to go moment, right? Maybe you're busy parents or maybe you're busy student and you need to find out how to uh, crotch a, a tea cozy for your uh, for yourself on or your, for your school project. So that's like I want to do moment, right? Um, or you could be a reporter um, once you graduate searching for background and story, that's like, I want to know moment, right? Um, does it make sense? Like, just just ask me questions if that doesn't make, make sense. Uh, anyways, uh, moving on. So the key is for brands to create mobile friendly content that's helpful and relevant and accessible when your customers want it, right? So in micro moments, we need to shift the way we reach our audiences by like understanding their lives rather than just focusing on demographics. So in fact, like researchers uh, estimate that brands are missing out on seven out of 10 potential customers if they just use traditional targeting. For instance, like 40% of our baby products are bought by people who live in households without kids. And 45% of home improvement searches are done by women. Home Depot used this insight to create a series of mobile DIY, do-it-yourself, how-to videos. They anticipated customer intent and were there to solve an unmet needs. Um, but that's not all. As many as like two-thirds of us we switch to another site if there are too many like steps to purchase or find the info you want. Um, so you need to make your users experience seamless by integrating design with their needs. For instance, like Virgin Airlines news new customers visited their mobile app to book tickets. Uh, so they streamlined their mobile strategy to fo focus on that. 75 for percent of us believe our smartphones help us become more uh, more productive, right? Um, and that's an opportunity for organization that adopt a mobile first mindset and create a big ideas for the small screen and map your customers challenge uh, challenges and then develop relevant, I wanna know go do or buy content that's visual, discoverable, and start with your customer's intent, right? Um, does anybody have any questions so far? Or was I making myself clear or, or comments, you know? All right, moving on. Okay, um, yeah. So according to Nielsen, like Americans now spend about 21% of their screen time on smartphones, all right? And if you look at the 18 to 34 year olds that increases to 29% and smartphone use eclipses, TV, right? So that makes it their first screen, right? Regardless of where you fall, there's no getting away from the importance of mobile communication. Uh, Google breaks down our mobile experiences into four main categories they call micro moments, which I just talked about a few minutes ago. So we talked about micro moments um, 
uh, just a few, um, few minutes ago, and they include I want to know moments for news and info, right? Yeah. I want to go moments where locations matters. I want to do moments which are about, all about ideas. And I want to I want to buy moments for purchase. So those moments can be further broken down by how quickly or urgently do we need the information. Behavioral economist Dan like Early says we should pay attention to time pressure in situation when a specific need may see exceed the time we have. Um, unquote. So and that means that you want you will want to consider the content your brand develops from another per perspective, right? So here's an example. Say you're booking a vacation, you may spend days or weeks searching for the perfect getaway, and you may compare locations, the type of vacation you want, the cost where you'll be staying in this these situations. If you had a good experience, loyalty can play a part. But what about a case when you're traveling on business? You're stuck at the airport at 10.30 at night. You just found out your flight home has been canceled. Your, uh, canceled. So, so you need to book a hotel and fast. And it's going to be relatively close to the airport because you don't want to spend a lot of time getting there the next morning to catch a new flight, right? So we turn to our smartphones and search based on availability. And I want to know moment and proximity or location. And I want to go moment, right? So maybe instead of like tapping, like we use voice search and ask our phones a question. And what we see or hear in the first few options is likely where we, we will end up, right? Our intent is more important than brand loyalty. That's why marketers should like not just consider their customers, but also the people they could help in urgent situation. Um, think about the type of questions they might be asking or how you can make the experience more seamless if your site or video is the first result they see. It all comes down to thinking beyond your target and imagining other situations people might be in where your brand could help them in the moment, right? Any questions so far or comments? Okay. All right, well, no comments, then I'll just continue. So how do you count a video view? Well, if I was like counting and this was like video, like my metric would be, did you make it all the way to the end and get a couple of valuable get takeaways? Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that. And it underscores the challenges of industry-wide standards for measuring the success of video campaigns, right? For starters, like many of the social platforms look at views differently. YouTube's TrueView and Google's Display Network ads count a view as 30 seconds of watch time or a full ad, right? Um, if it's like shorter than that, like Pinterest, Reddit, LinkedIn, and Twitter say a view consists of two seconds with 50% viewability. Although Twitter also counts turning the sound on or clicking on a video to expand it. And beyond that, one makes up an impression or engagement, or how would you define that? Can you compare TV ads to video on social? There are so many elements to, to consider. That's why the Media Rating Council or MRC worked with other 175 businesses, including the Interactive Advertising Guru to develop its new cross-media measurement standards. MRC is a not-for-profit industry group founded over 50 years ago with a goal of developing TV measurement standards that are valid, reliable, and effective. Its members include brands, agencies, and trade associations. So here's an overview of the MRC's standards, 
being launched in 2021, first, there's a definition um, of viewability, right? In order for a view to be considered an impression, a video must have 100% of its pixels seen for at least two consecutive seconds. This provides a standard uh, that's usable on both TV and digital platforms. MRC also added time spent or duration as a key performance indicator. And they're breaking out audio impressions in order to compare when a video was played with sound versus without. As you might imagine, like these changes did not happen without their share of debate, mm -hmm. Uh, but overall, they're good for the industry because MRC updated measurements uh, for the digital age and they leveled the playing field in order to compare ad performance consistently across screens and platforms. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. All right, so there's no doubt working with the influencers is on the rise. So according to the report by Business Insider, by 2022, um, companies will spend as much as like $15 billion on influencer marketing. Today, nearly 80% of influencer programs happen in Instagram. Yet like the landscapes, um, landscape and rules of engagement they continue to change and it's difficult finding the influencers who are a good fit for your audience and brand. Are you looking for reach or to build awareness? If you have the budget, you may want to consider digital or traditional stars, or maybe you rather have closer relationship with your influencers. That's where a more niche group like micro influencers comes in. Right. So micro influencers, the most popular influencer group on Instagram, have fewer than like 10,000 followers. Right. Because of that, their rates are generally lower than stars. And this provides an opportunity for smaller brands who may not have the budget to afford a celebrity to develop develop an effective influencer plan. So that's why you might see like a smaller like. YouTubers like doing up like you know advertising, which is kind of surprising sometimes. So that's like another tactic that you probably notice if you're watching a lot of YouTuber, like Instagrammers, whatever. Um, so now if you want to get even more niche, there's a category called nano influencers who have between 10 to 5,000, sorry, 1,000 to 5,000 followers. Uh that's for those, does anybody have like 10,000? I'm sorry, 1,000 followers. You can brag about it if you want. Anybody? I have about like 300 followers, which is not bad. Anyways, um, nano influencers usually cost even less than micro influencers because their reach is lower and they're often more specialized, right? So nano influencers are also closely connected with their followers, right? Um, who consider them almost like a friend and that can result in higher trust and engagement, right? But because they may be hobbyists, it could take more time to manage them. And because they have less than 10,000 followers, nano influencers aren't able to share a link right from their post only in their bio, and then makes attribution and ROI a bit harder for brands, right? Um, and then there are bots or virtual influencers, like little Miquela, little Miquela has like 1.6 million followers in this story. Does anybody follow little Miquela? Anyways, um, if you do, just let me know. If uh, I'm really interested in what you think of that. Yeah, Bob. But anyways, th that influ virtual influencer that has some promotions for brands like Prada or Calvin Klein and release songs on Spotify, even though she or it 
is just a computer generated creation owned by a company. So avatars like these are becoming more popular at engaging with consumers. And in an era of deep fake videos and concerns around privacy and ethics, we need to ask ourselves whether virtual influencers should be forced to disclose, dis, disclose like they're not human in the same way human influencers must disclose payment, right? So if you're a brand that wants to work with influencers, how would you get started? First, establish a budget and whether you're going to reach for a need or niche. Then determine what success looks like uh, and develop metrics tied to business goals. When you choose influencers to work with, be sure your brand values are aligned with theirs, right? Define the scope of the partnership, but also give influencers the freedom to be creative. They know their audience better than you. And while Instagram is still the most popular platform, remember, you can also create programs on YouTube, uh, Pinterest, Twitter, and even like an, an influencer, influencer's blog, right? Okay, does anybody have any questions so far?